Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all. Welcome to Christ the King Anglican Church. If you're new here, my name is Jesse, and I get to be the pastor here. And today is a good day to be here for the first time, if you're here for the first time, because we have a barbecue after church. So I would welcome you to stay after. I would love to hear more of your story, get to know you a little bit. Please do stay and enjoy. We have lots of food in the back, and we're going to reiterate that in our announcement. Right, Stephen? <laughs> Well, if you're just joining us for the first time, we're walking through the book of Acts together. We've been doing that for several weeks. We're on week 15 or so of that, and we're going to continue doing that. And this week, we're on Acts chapter 16, and we're going to look at today three snapshots of faithfulness of God's people as the mission of God continues to unfold in this place at this time. Three different ways that people join in with a mission of God to bring his light and life and peace into the world, his forgiveness that is found in the Son of Jesus Christ, in his Son Jesus Christ, and all the good news that he came with his kingdom, that people are joining in together with this mission to carry it out into the world. And so today we're going to look at three snapshots of what that looks like of people joining in with that. Now, one of the challenges that we have in our Christian life. If you've been around the church for some time, I've mentioned it before here, but it's something that I like to call hero conditioning, hero conditioning. That's uh, something where you read through the Bible, and as you read through the biblical narrative, you see all sorts of what seem like larger-than-life characters, people like Moses or Abraham or Esther or David or Paul or Mary. And these are, of course, our wonderful people that have given themselves over to God. But for many of us, they can sort of seem otherworldly, larger than life. And then just to add on to this hero conditioning, just for inspiration, because normal people often don't make the most exciting sermon examples. I am guilty of this. Us preachers often will give examples of inspirational heroes of the faith, to talk about their stories and, and how they did big, big things for God. Now, of course, that's not a bad thing. It's good to see what God can do in and through all people, people that are given over to his Holy Spirit and how he works and he acts in all people's lives. And, of course, maybe some of us here may be people that they give sermon examples about in the future because of the work of the Holy Spirit in us and through us when we yield over to him. But sometimes, sometimes as we read through the scriptures and we see these larger-than-life characters and we hear sermon examples about these larger-than-life heroes of the faith, albeit very good for us and inspirational, sometimes it can have the opposite effect of what is intended. It can sometimes be a little bit demotivating, at least for me. Because you might say, oh, these people are great, but, you know, they're heroes. They're these amazing big people Little old me, I'm just normal. That stuff's not for me. That's for these big characters and these big heroes in the Bible. Don't mind me, I'm just normal. Now, the reality, of course, is that God works for his glory in all people and through all hearts that are yielded over to him. And he looks at things in a completely different scale than we do. He doesn't judge on the outward, he judges on the inward. And what God wants from us ultimately it's not big heroic acts necessarily, it's just faithfulness. It's yielding and responding and being who God wants us to be, where we are in the place that we live in. It's funny, I remember being in a church training, church leadership seminar one time, and you know, they had a time for Q&A, and somebody raised their hand, and he started asking a question, and the speaker said, oh, wait, 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 before you ask the question, tell me, what do you do for your church? And the person who was asking the question said, oh, me, I'm just a volunteer. And to make a point, the speaker, he just drew it out big time. He goes, just a volunteer? And, of course, he was trying, not trying to embarrass the guy, but he was trying to make the point that volunteers, there is no just a volunteer in the kingdom of God. There is no just a volunteer in the church. There is no just a single person yielded over to God's will and God's grace in their lives. There is no such thing. He wanted to emphasize how important all people are in the body of Christ. What matters, again, is God's is a response in faithfulness to what God calls us to do. 
Now, for me and for this church, that's why whenever we come across a story like we're going to see here in Acts chapter 16, I want to make sure that we take time to slow down a little bit and we look at all the ways that God works through different types of people in different scenarios. Now, sometimes it is heroic. Sometimes it is sort of larger than life. But most of the time, as we, if you pay attention as you're walking through the scriptures, most of the time it's just normal people responding to God. Of course, what matters, of course, is that underneath every response is one single idea, and that is faithfulness. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes this, 1 Corinthians 4.2, what is required of a servant, yet that they remain faithful? What is required of God's servant, yet that they remain faithful? Faithfulness is what God wants from us, And so today we're going to look at three snapshots again of faithfulness, of what that looks like, and think about and pray about what that might look like in our lives together. So if you have your scriptures, uh, in your scriptures, in your Bible, or on your iPhones, in airplane mode, you can go to Acts chapter 16. We're going to walk through this together, and it starts out here with verse 1, chapter 16. It says, Paul, excuse me, Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. And Rachel, thank you again for reading all those hard names. You did a great job. So, uh, so Paul, it says, Paul came to Derby and to Lystra. So just to orient us as we jump in, uh, we're jumping in on what commentators would call Paul's second missionary journey. He went on in his first journey, and then last week we heard how he went back to the Jerusalem council. They had some big decisions to pray through and to discern, to retain unity, but also to send out the gospel into the world. And so Paul goes back to Jerusalem, and then now he's out on his second journey. journey. And in chapter 16, we're catching back up with him as he's going on his journey. And so if we were watching a movie about the, the book of Acts, you might hear a narrator say, meanwhile in Lystra, or something like that. So we're catching back up with him. He, he is just traveling through. He's in southern Turkey. So this is what uh, the modern-day city is called Elystra. For the old Greek word, Lystra, he's traveling through um, this part of southern Turkey. And Paul's actually going back to check on a place he already did ministry. In fact, we heard about it. We did a whole sermon about it, Acts chapter 14. It's online. You can go check it out on how Paul and Barnabas entered it into Lystra and did ministry. And so Paul's going back to check on a place where he did ministry. And it says as he entered into the town, it says a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was Greek. Now right here, I want to pause and get our first snapshot. Now it's it's easy for us as you're just reading through the book of the Bible just to say, oh, we can just read quickly. Oh, there was a disciple there named Timothy. Great. Thanks for the information. But if you go back to Acts 14 and see what actually happened, the fact that there is a strong disciple in Lystra is actually quite amazing. It's actually quite amazing uh, because we didn't get to tell you the rest of the story. So just to refresh our memories, Paul and Barnabas go into Lystra. They go in first to serve, then they say hard things. They say, leave these vain things, these idols that you're trying to worship. Turn to this living God who will satisfy your heart. The people think that they're actually Zeus and Hermes because they see a healing taking place. So the town all goes crazy. They go into a frenzy. They bring out a bull. They want to bring out garlands and sacrifices. And they say, this is Zeus and Hermes. Come among us. Because they don't want to be guilty of not showing uh, hospitality to some gods. And so Saul, I mean, excuse me, Paul, he tears his clothes. He says, we are but men. And so he says, I came to tell you about the living God. Repent and believe in this living God, and you will have new life and satisfaction for your hearts. Now, that's what we talked about in the sermon. But what we didn't have time to talk about was just a few verses later in Acts chapter 14, we see that some people from the synagogue in Iconium, which wasn't too far away, they came up to Lystra, and it says they came to stir up trouble. And so they started spreading some rumors. And it's interesting, this same crowd, the same group of people that said, these are gods, let us worship them, and they wanted to give sacrifices to them. These same people, what's in a crowd, by the way, you can never trust a crowd, in just a day or two are the same people that drag them out of town and stone Paul and Barnabas and leave them for dead. So what started out as looking like this amazing success with crowds and crowds and throngs of people responding to God 
turned out to be a massive failure, at least from outward, from an outward perspective, at least from what you could count on the outside. In fact, the failure is so big that it almost cost Paul and Barnabas their lives. Now again, from external standards, this part of their mission looked like a complete failure. The crowds are with them at first, and then they turn on them. They don't just turn on them, they stone them. What at first looked like amazing, what, an amazing response only turned out to be at least what looked like complete rejection. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know about you. I've done different kinds of mission trips. We lived in Cambodia for eight years. Uh, we've done lots of different things. But if I were in Paul and Barnabas's shoes, or better yet, sandals, if I were in their sandals at this time, this would have been the time in my own life where I started to do some discerning. And it wouldn't have taken me very long to discern, you know, maybe God's not with me. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe I should go back and chill in Jerusalem and make some tents and just sort of be a faithful person. But what did they do? They healed. They got up. They continued to on with God's calling for them. They lived into faithfulness even despite everything outside of them looking like a complete failure. And the result, the result, even though on the outside it looked like a complete failure, they come back about five years later, that's Acts 16, probably about four to five years later, and they come into a town where they were stoned, where they were ran out, and lo and behold, there's a group of people who are worshiping the true and living God. And not only worshiping this true and living God, but actually creating disciples. A disciple so solid, in fact, that this one disciple that was discipled at this place that was a failure would go on to be one of the main leaders of the worldwide church. This is why Paul could write in 1 Corinthians, What is required of a servant, yet that they remain faithful and trust God to do the rest. Now, for us here at Christ the King in Denver, Colorado, thankfully, at least the last time I checked, I don't think we're in danger of being stoned by anyone. Unless you know, give me that information. I would love to know that. But we will all encounter times, we will all encounter challenges where we feel like the crowds are against us. We will all encounter times where, at least by outward measures and outward results, as we look around our lives and, and the things that we try to do, we may seem like we are failing. Or it may seem like results or fruit are weak or non-existent. You might say something like, I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed and i yet to see anything happen. Or I've tried to have these conversations with my neighbors and I keep dropping hints about God and about church and they just say, wow, you're religious and then just drop it from there. Actually, that happened to me. Or you might think to yourself, man, it would just be so much easier to go along with the consensus of the crowd, the cultural zeitgeist, and just sort of float along with that current than to hold my guns on this issue. You might have felt that way. The scriptures call us in all of these times, whether in high fruitfulness or perceived failure, whether we're with the crowds or against the crowds, whether we see everything going our way or not, they call us to come back to the scripture and say, what is required of a servant, yet that they remain faithful? And as we look through church history, we can see movements of seasons in the church, seasons where the church was extremely fruitful and just seemed to be exploding and bursting at the seams. But then you can also see times where the church just sort of held on and just sort of held on to its faith. Now, I don't know what's next here for us in the United States and in the world but certainly as we continue to see the changes in culture around us, we may see seasons where we feel like the crowds are against us. We may experience seasons that seem at least at first blush a little bit drier, at least from our perspective in time. It's always so easy to be faithful when there's immediate confirmation of our faithfulness that everything seems to be working, but it's a lot harder when it doesn't look like things are going your way. The greater question to us is even in times of failure, even when the crowds are against us, will we remain faithful? Let us pray for times of fruitfulness and abundance, but let's also pray that we remain faithful in all seasons, whether the crowds are against us, whether we see fruit or don't.
Let us remain faithful. So that's the first snapshot. That's Paul and Barnabas. They were extremely faithful. And the result of their faithfulness was that a group of people were worshiping God. And one of the disciples that came out of that was Timothy. Verse 3, it says this as we read on. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was Greek. Now it's interesting. Not only did this failure produce a disciple... But Paul was, in fact, so impressed by the faith and the character and the reputation of Timothy that he wanted him to come along on his journeys together with him. And we know that as we go on to read through the Bible that there is actually two books in the whole New Testament that are addressed to Timothy for his formation. And, in fact, several books that Timothy co-authors together with the Apostle Paul. So, again, just to point out, out of this perceived failure, getting run out of town and not seeing any fruit, we have approximately 30% of the New Testament <laughs> that's being written. Well, two people that aren't, being, that aren't mentioned here but are mentioned later in the Bible are Lois and Eunice. And Lois and Eunice are the grandmother and mother of Timothy. And so we know if we read through parts of First and Second Timothy that not only did Paul and Barnabas contribute to the faith of this young man, Timothy, who was growing up in it, but perhaps even more so, Lois and Eunice were indispensable to his discipleship and coming to faith. So in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, it says this. Uh, Paul's writing this to Timothy. He says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. Now, of course, we know that the source of Timothy's faith, faith, face and faith was God and the Holy Spirit drawing him to himself. But we see lots of people contributing to his faith. We got Paul and Barnabas who were heroic. They brushed off the stoning and kept going. But also, perhaps even more importantly, we have Eunice and Lois who did basic things like acquainting him with the scriptures and sharing their faith with young Timothy as he grew up. And so we see that even in the heroic and in the just normal, God used all things for his glory. In fact, brought together something that would be part of 30% of the New Testament. Now, it's interesting. As we look through church history, especially in the first 300 years, we definitely see our fair share of heroes. And they're great to read about. It's great to read what they said and how they responded, especially because they're so close to biblical culture. But many historians would attribute the growth and establishment of the early church to the very normal lives of people who were just being faithful. Now, Alan Kreider, he's a historian, he's a church historian that wrote a lot about the early church. He wrote a book that I love, that I highly recommend. Maybe if you uh, take a vacation and go sit on a beach Here's some thrilling reading for you. It's called The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. An interesting title. I promise you, thrilling. Anyways, it traces how the church went from a persecuted minority, like we see Paul and Barnabas experiencing, to a major movement in the Roman world, all while not enjoying political favor for those first few centuries. And it's a great book. I highly recommend it, by the way. But here's what he says. Here's one of his main points about the early church. He says this. The Christians grew because their focus at that time was not on saving people or recruiting them. It was on living faithfully. And the belief that when people's lives are rehabituated in the way of Jesus, others will want to join them. This saving people, the Christians believed, was God's work, not theirs. So they did not engage in frantic action to save those who were not baptized. Instead, they entrusted outsiders to God. The church patiently entrusted itself to God, who would bring people into the community of saints participating in truth by the arduous means of catechesis and baptism. Now, I don't read that quote to suggest that we should stop sharing the good news of Jesus with those outside the church. God calls us to do that. We have that opportunity in many of our spheres of influence. His message of forgiveness and new life is for all people, and God calls us to carry that message. But it is worth noting, it is worth noting, that in a time of low education, in a time of people just living their normal lives, that many historians would attribute the growth of the church just to normal people 
being faithful within their spheres. In fact, there's an amazing quote in the book when it's talking about how early, the early church was still trying to figure out its theology. And it talked about how vendors would argue with other vendors about the Arian heresy of whether God, whether the Arian theology is right or whether God is truly Trinity or not. And through this conversation, even in market vendors, people came to faith, and that's how the church grew. For much of history, in fact, most of history, God used just normal people living just faithful lives to spread his message of faith and hope to the world. God used Eunice and Lois, acquainting Timothy with the scriptures, giving them his faith, giving him their faith. He uses the heroic people, yes, but he, in fact, even more so throughout history, he uses those who are faithful and just normal. God works through all people who are yielded to his name. What is re- required of a servant yet that they remain faithful? Now, last snapshot that I want to cover in Acts chapter 16. I didn't know if we had time, but I couldn't skip this because we have their namesake in our church who also happens to be wearing a purple dress, just like the person in the Bible. We have Lydia. We heard about her in Acts chapter 16, verses 11. Lydia, we might as well just wave. Okay, very good. Lydia, wearing a purple dress, we didn't plan this, but Lydia was a seller of purple things. <laughs> and um, That's awesome. So as we read through the chapter, we see that, uh, so Paul goes through various journeys. He comes into Philippi, which is, this is considered the first place where he's truly ministering in what we now call Europe. And while he's there praying and sharing, he meets a woman named Lydia, a seller of purple goods. So in verse 14, it says this. As Paul was sharing and as they were praying, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Now, we don't know too much about Lydia, but we do know that she was a wealthy businesswoman. We know that she was a purveyor of purple goods. We know that when she came to faith, that she was a person of influence because it says her and her whole household came to faith together with her. And that Greek word there is oikos. It doesn't just mean her kids, but it means all the people that were attached to her entrepreneurial endeavor. So in this time, merchants would travel around to different towns and different cities, and they would sort of bring their whole entourage and all their goods together with them. So this would have been her kids, her employees, all the people that were connected to her enterprise all came to faith because Lydia came to faith. We know also, many historians believe also that the church in Philippi, which, by the way, merited a whole other book of the entire Bible. It's crazy. We have a lot of the New Testament written just through these, what's happened here. A lot of historians believe that the church in Philippi was meeting in Lydia's house, and so she offered her house for the church to meet. We know that she was probably a patron and a benefactor of the church. And so maybe she supported Paul on his missionary journeys. And she used her wealth to serve others in many different ways. Now, we don't know the extent of her involvement, but we do know that she was important. And we do know that she was influential. And we do do know most of all that God worked through her to play a central role in the founding of the church of Philippi. Her and her whole household being the founding members. Now back to what I said at the beginning, this whole hero conditioning. So we look at the life of Lydia. Hopefully it's true of this Lydia here. She's not a martyr, so she didn't die early. She didn't go on these big missions or do these big things that we know of. She didn't brush off a stoning that we know of. She didn't do these amazing quote-unquote heroic things. But she was faithful. She was faithful with what she had. She brought her faith into all of her relationships, her oikos. She gave of her resources, her house, her wealth, all for the glory of God. And the result was the the founding of one of the main churches of of the entire New Testament. What is required of a servant, yet that they remain faithful? Now for us here, God has given us all something, some sort of resource or resources, God has given us all relationships and oikos, so to speak, that we interact with and that we work with and love and live with. 
God calls us to be faithful with all that he has given us today. What is required of a servant, yet that they remain faithful? And we pray a lot for different things in this church, that God would work and move, that he would show his glory, that he would heal people, that he would draw people to himself. We pray for a lot of things in this church, and we'll continue to pray for them and for all of you. But let it be said, one of the things that we pray for CTK the most is that God would see us as a faithful church, faithful and yielded over to him. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. Lord, we again thank you for your grace and for your love. We thank you that your Holy Spirit saw fit to include all different profiles of people in your scripture as people that were part of your mission and your plan to reach the entire world with your light and your love. We pray for all of us here, Lord. We pray that you would help us to be faithful in our workplaces, amongst our families, in our friendships, in this church. Lord, make us a people who are faithful. Guide us by the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we do pray that we would get to join in with the great glory of you revealing your goodness to the whole world. Lord, thank you for being here and present. Be with us, Lord, we pray, as we walk together as a church. So we lift this time up to your great and holy name. Amen.